I would like to also say thank you to IRISE for sponsoring this event. At this time, I will turn over to Mitch to get us started. Thanks, Adrian. I appreciate it. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, before we get to Susanna, I'd like to uh, uh, maybe set up, set up her presentation a little bit by talking about visualization. Uh, for some of you, it may be a new concept. And uh, it's certainly catching on um, very well with our customers. We've got um, over 20,000 business analysts now visualizing on a day-to-day -day basis, and uh, Susanna's company being one of them. Um, you know, maybe to set things up at the highest levels, uh, what we're hearing from IT leadership is that the last three years have obviously been a tough ones. They've been focused on cost cutting and uh, efficiencies and IT leaders, CIOs have really focused on things like data center consolidation, application rationalization, and expanding global sourcing options as strategies to, to cut costs. Um, but what we're hearing now, if we go to the next slide, is that, uh, that uh, the pendulum's swinging back towards innovation. Um, all the latest surveys from CIO Magazine, from Gartner, from Forrester, are showing that CIOs are under increasing pressure from the business to work in partnership and collaboration with the business to speed up the delivery of, of innovation, uh, net new technology initiatives, business initiatives that will drive revenue growth and, and new opportunities. Uh, and we're seeing this in um, being reflected in IT budget, IT budgets being increased. Um, we're seeing this in survey data that's showing that um, the pent-up demand for net new applications is, is growing. And this is all great news for business analysts um, because as, as BAs, we're on the front lines of, of creating these new applications. Next slide. And, um, you know, really the BA is the critical link in, um, in driving the success. On the next slide, though, what we what we've found is that uh, from our talking with our customers on this issue over the last several years is that the way that, so that business software is designed, developed, and delivered is fundamentally broken. And all the latest Standish Group numbers from last year seem to indicate this. In fact, um, this is a direct quote from their report, is that they found the worst project failure rate in, in over a decade. So fully two-thirds of the projects that they surveyed fail which means that they're either late, they're over budget, or they're missing critical features needed by the business. And um, next, on the next slide, we, um, from, from our conversations, we really have figured out that the reason for this, there are two major issues, we think, for the project failure rate. And um, much of this project failure rate is, is based on bad communication between business and IT. And it really comes down to two issues. One, that business users really don't know what they want until they see and interact with it. And if they're, the first time that they're seeing and interacting with a system is after it's already been coded and tested, then obviously making changes at that point is going to be expensive, not only in cost, but in delays to projects. The second major issue that we're seeing is that um, business users, next slide, is that business users really can't interpret the tools that are being used by business analysts today. I mean, if you're a business analyst, typically what you're going to be doing is documenting, eliciting and documenting requirements using Word, um, maybe spreadsheets, maybe trying to do some static screenshots with PowerPoint. And you're, you're sitting down with the business stakeholder using these tools. Um, you're creating giant functional specs. Uh, the business users really are having a hard time interpreting this, either in one-on-one -on -one meetings or stakeholder review sessions. And oftentimes, they'll take the attitude, look, I'll, I know it when I'll see it, I, and they'll just go ahead and sign off on these documents. Then as a BA, you're forced to turn around and then hand these documents, these artifacts off downstream to the development organization, training, QA, and documentation folks who have uh, just as a hard time trying to interpret the text and the, and the static nature of these, these artifacts. Next slide. So uh, we hear poor stories all the time. And do you really want to walk into your next stakeholder review meeting with, with a giant 500-page functional spec 
and watch everybody's eyes glaze over. And that's very typical. Next slide. I mean, the, the effect of this is, is dramatic, obviously, um, both on a project and business level with delays and cost overruns, but also on a personal level for BAs. Um, causes a lot of overtime and, and delays and long hours. And um, I think a lot of the, the, the stuff that we hear from BAs constantly is, you know, uh, getting the proper recognition and um, validation as, as, a, as a function in the company is it, you really just don't want to get associated with these kinds of, of train wreck projects. Next slide. So what we think uh, really is the solution here is to really empower business analysts to quickly assemble working previews. We call them visualizations of applications during the elicitation process. In other words, the very first thing you want to do is to help the business visualize what they're proposing to build. And a visualization created in iRise is, is uh, very fast. It takes a matter of, of hours to pull together um, a nice high fidelity visualization that mimics not just the look and feel of the proposed application, but the way it behaves as well. And it's really only that fully immersive experience for the, for the business stakeholder that will elicit the right requirements and do it quickly so that you're now, um, next slide, you're now transforming the way that you're communicating between biz the, the business and IT. So it's not just the visualization that you're handing off downstream. It's the visualization with the functional spec and the ar other artifacts that's now just eliminating uh, all the confusion and getting everybody on the same page. Next slide. Uh, we get asked all the time, what can you visualize with iRise? Well, basically anything with the user interface. And you know, the more complex, the better. But uh, new custom applications, web applications, rich internet applications with complex AJAX behavior, uh, package applications, you know, extensions to SAP and Oracle. Um, there are iPhone and Blackberry templates available from our website to help you visualize mobile applications. You know, we've even had customers uh, visualize green screen applications as well. Uh, so that's where you want to use iRise. It's any time that you have a, a user interface that you need to show to the business ahead of time. Next slide. So as I mentioned, we've got uh, tens of thousands of BAs using iRise on a daily basis. And what they're telling us is that it helps get them to market twice as fast. Um, organizations are transformed. You're, you're doing these projects at a whole lot less cost because you're virtually eliminating rework. And for the first time, uh, BAs are empowered to really take a front line, front and center seat in, in project success. Next slide. So our vision is that very soon here, all business software is going to be visualized. It just makes sense. I mean, you wouldn't dream of designing a new car or an airplane with a drafting board anymore. You know, why are we building complex software with equivalents of drafting boards? And with that, I will um, uh, turn this over to Susanna. Next slide. Um, Susanna is uh, uh, really interesting to talk with. I mean, she's been working at her company now for 17 years. 17 years at a biotech company, I think, is some kind of record. I don't know if we could put that into the Guinness Book of World's Records. but. Um, she's had a lot of different jobs during that time, including uh, jobs in manufacturing, process development, legal, finance, sales, and marketing. But she transitioned to a full-time BA role in 1997. So she's been doing the BA role for 13 years now, and more recently, in the last two years, has expanded into user experience and organizational change management, uh, which gives her a, a really interesting perspective on um, many different functions within the company, both on the business and IT side. And um, I apologize we can't name this company uh, straight up <coughs> due to uh, rules around their corporate communications, but some of you may figure out which company it is. But it is a very, it's a very large leading biotech firm. And what they've been doing is using uh, visualization on a number of projects. And uh, Susanna is here to talk to us about how they've leveraged visualization. So with that, I'll turn it over to her. Thank you very much, Mitch. I really want to thank you for inviting me to join today and also to Modern Analyst for hosting this webinar. Um, so I am very excited today to talk about how we've been addressing the broken method, the uh, large requirements documents, the large functional specifications. 
Uh, for me, uh, the real key to keeping everyone on the same page and having successful project execution is uh, our ability to have a shared pool of knowledge and to consistently increase that shared pool of knowledge throughout the duration of the project. And iRISE is a huge uh, advance in my ability to keep that shared pool of knowledge moving ahead as we develop um, our solutions, but also as we define our problems along the way. Uh, we, do, we don't just design solutions. We agree on what the problems are that we want to solve. Next slide, please. So uh, Mitch has covered a lot of this already. Um, I am specifically using a case study from our Access Solutions program. Uh, Access Solutions is a group of people at my company that help patients and their doctors uh, access reimbursement services. As we all know, we have a very challenging health care uh, situation in this country, and many uh, patients who are diagnosed with uh, severe uh, medical conditions do not know if their insurance covers them. And so what our job is to do is to improve our online presence around reimbursement support for those patients. And next slide, please. So the, the uh, program that we are going to launch shortly is called My Patient Solutions. And it is really a very simple system if you look at it from a 500-foot view. It involves two main tasks. We are enrolling patients for services online. So this is doctor's offices signing up their patients for reimbursement support. Uh, that largely entails investigating their benefits and helping them get access to copay assistance uh, and foundation assistance if they're unable to cover the cost of their uh, uh, uninsured uh, uh, drugs or any other types of treatments. So um, once patients are enrolled, then the doctor's office will have the ability to check the status of that patient's reimbursement case online. So that means that the doctor's offices can make decisions more quickly about treatment and not have to necessarily speak to a person unless they have a more in-depth question. Next slide, please. So we were trying to address three, uh, well, really two main problems. And we discovered a third problem along the way. So the first problem uh, is that our current site does not speak clearly to healthcare providers. Uh, I think most of us have experienced a website or system where over time more and more information gets added and people can't find what they need. So um, not only was the key, is the key data on our current site not really prioritized, uh, and some of the features around accessing reimbursement services are, have become buried within our site, but it doesn't have the personal touch that we would like for this website to have. Our reimbursement services team is known for their personal touch, but our website doesn't reflect that. So these were the three main problems that we wanted to address. And uh, our second problem is that because our end users are outside of our company, uh, we do not have a lot of access to them. And we know that we need to make this system uh, extremely usable. We have users who work for large practices. They have uh, IT staff and training. And we have users at small practices that may not use the computer very much at all and may be new users to applications like email. So we really need to make sure that we are addressing all levels of computer literacy, which means that usability is uh, extremely important. And we also know from our uh, field teams that our users are really pressed for time. Their main focus is the patient and treating that patient as effectively and quickly as possible. And any extra time spent on our website or any of our programs uh, is time wasted for them. Now the third problem we discovered along the way, and I will spend some time talking about this, is that the team that was brought together to solve these two problems is a very complex team and it also geographically dispersed. Uh, we have home office staff who uh, take the calls from the doctor's offices and patients. We have a field reimbursement team that, uh, it, they're not sales, but they 
uh, partner with sales and help the doctor's offices understand the reimbursement landscape. So they are visiting uh, doctor's offices on a routine basis. We have our marketing team, we have our IT team, and we also have several external agencies that we partner with. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So when I developed this slide, I intentionally meant to make it somewhat overwhelming because, as I mentioned before, our team is very complex. And I'm going to start at the top uh, with our end users who are healthcare providers. And they don't have much real estate on this slide on purpose because, we, as I said, we really don't have much access to them. Uh, in fact, we try not to interrupt them in their very critical job of treating patients. Um, we have two uh, main teams within the company. One is the sales and marketing team. That's where the uh, reimbursement services live. And we also have our IT team. And we have a very strong partnership, and our relationship is uh, very important. So uh, starting on the sales and marketing side, you see that there's four different teams within that. We have the Access Solutions Home Office team and field team. So again, these are the people who specifically focus on reimbursement services. And you'll see that within the Home Office team alone, we have six different product teams, four different process roles, and then we also have another dimension on um, employees who focus on patients who are insured versus employees who focus on patients who are not insured. Those are two different um, paradigms that we support, and there's a lot of different knowledge that goes with both. So if we start doing the math, we can see that just within the Access Solutions Home Office alone, we have many different perspectives that we needed to harmonize. That is a very large shared pool of knowledge that we needed to pull together and that we need to keep together as we go along with our project. And uh, if I may jump to the punchline a little bit, using pictures has been hugely valuable and um, allowing people to respond to our, our visualization as opposed to our um, lengthy documents has made the harmonization of those uh, different perspectives possible. I don't think it would be possible without the visualization tool. Now, the Home Office team, we meet together, and uh, we're able to look at um, our visualizations together. Now, the field team, they are rarely at the home office, so we use WebEx and the visualizations as well as giving them access to the iRISE models um, offline. And again, there in the field team, we have the same six product teams, uh, and we have users or uh, field team members all across the United States. So again, just trying to get them to uh, understand what we're trying to accomplish and to agree on the progress we're making is challenging. On the managed care marketing side, we have uh, on our internal team, we have a group who are primarily concerned with our branding and our voice. Again, Access Solutions as a team is known for their personal touch. And so how, uh, how we present ourselves, how we promote our services is very important, and it needs to align with that personal touch and, and high touch service. Uh, we have our communication team. On, we uh, also have a compliance team. You know, as uh, members of the healthcare industry, we have a number of regulations and policies that we need to adhere to around product safety and other things like that. So um, everything that we do from an IT perspective has to adhere to our branding, voice, communication, and compliance guidelines. Again, another uh, set of perspectives to incorporate. And then we also leverage the services of three different agencies, one for um, developing our style and our content per our guidelines. We do have a web design agency that designs the overall look and feel and the overall navigation of the website. The program I'm working on is just one portion of that website. And then we also do partner with a an agency that performs usability studies and evaluations with real end users on our behalf. And uh, we have had excellent relationships with all of these agencies, and we have leveraged our visualizations to communicate with them as well. 
Now on the IT side, I'm going to start to speed up here, uh, we're using several different kinds of technology. And just as it, it's important for us to get the perspectives of our access solutions and marketing teams in place, we also need to harmonize our perspectives with the IT teams. And the, each IT team, the Salesforce team, uh, our vignette team, which is our presentation layer, our security team and our data teams, we all need to have shared perspectives as well. We need to understand our business and we need to understand each other. And let me tell you, on a daily basis we are learning about each other's uh, technologies. We are learning about each other's uh, best practices. And so our models work for the IT team just as much and just as often as we do for our internal and external customers. So within Salesforce, uh, which is our transactional system, we have two different perspectives to harmonize. We have our field sales perspective and also our internal case management team. And what we deliver has to work for them and cannot disturb uh, systems already in place for them. Our vignette layer, again, is our presentation layer and where we do dynamic content management. And uh, we have an internal team that focuses uh, on um, how we uh, manage the content and the external team, which is how we uh, deliver that content to people outside the company. Our security layer is very important because we are managing patient information, which is highly sensitive. We have to make sure that we have a very robust authentication uh, and also identity verification process. And we also need to make sure that that aligns with HIPAA guidelines. This is patient privacy guidelines at the national level. Uh, we are not a HIPAA-covered entity, but we like to behave as though we are because we take patients' privacy very seriously. And we also have our master data team. Uh, we have data that we leverage that is specific to our reimbursement uh, activities and the reimbursement landscape in the country. But we also have other domain-wide sales and marketing data that we have to um, leverage, and we don't always have control to change. So that was a mouthful, um, but as you can see, we have many, many different perspectives that have had to become harmonized and stay harmonized throughout the course of this project. And again, I don't think I could accomplish it without visualization. Next slide, please. So we chose visualization uh, as a department. The IT team decided that we no longer could survive uh, and meet our, our timelines and, and support our patients, which uh, is the most important thing that we do, uh, using these old um, techniques, the, the use case scenarios, the, the requirements documents that are hundreds of pages long. Um, we are not abandoning those types of deliverables, but we realized we needed to do something more innovative and more cutting edge in order to deliver the value to the patients. So um, because we're using visualization, we are able to more effectively understand um, how branding and voice uh, will overlay the, the technologies that we're using. Um, that's very important for addressing our first problem, which is that our, our website doesn't speak clearly to our end users. Um, we're able to better negotiate what, where the priority information should go, how information should lay out on the screen, what, which is the key real estate and what should we put there. Um, and again, we have many different perspectives on that, but we, we've found that we've been able to early on identify those key real estate areas and stick to it. Um, and make sure that key tasks are easy to find and easy to launch. Um, for our problem, our second problem, where we have minimal access to our end users, we've been able to simplify the navigation. So uh, we believe that um, anyone who has used a system, who uses email, who is, uses a computer at all, should be able to recognize our navigation and follow it. We realize that if we have users who are really new to computing, this may not be the best tool for them, and we have other alternatives. Um, we have streamlined the most key task, which is uh, the enrollment process, getting patients signed up for services. And of course, with the third problem, we have been able to quickly align feedback uh, across the teams. I have found that I have 
done hundreds of impromptu presentations using the model and have been able to get uh, people I've never met and barely have spoken to up to speed quickly um, over the phone, over WebEx, or in person, um, regardless of their discipline, whether they are uh, technical or business, whether they are tech savvy or not. Next slide, please. So um, what, what we've done, uh, in fact, I'm actually thinking to skip this slide. I'd like to get straight into, the, um, into what the model looks like. I think that's what we're all here for. How did we do it, and, and how, how consistent was um, our visual approach over time? I think you'll see that we hit our, uh, our basic design pretty early and then refined it over the course of some months. So this, uh, what we're looking at now is the very first iRISE that, um, model that we showed our internal access solutions team. And this was based on our initial requirements. We mocked this up with the help of our technical team. I never show a model to uh, non-technical team members without getting input from the IT team first. I like to know that the model represents a design that can be built. So I think that's extremely important. Again, it, it helps with the shared pool of knowledge, making sure that everyone is on the same page. So what we had here was um, some of our key uh, data and features that we, we believed we should um, start with. It, if, uh, if nothing else, this was very important. We wanted to show um, patient enrollment status uh, and whether or not that patient was currently being, um, currently had a case being managed by our staff. And uh, we use this as the conversation starter. We didn't know if this met the design that was being envisioned by the business, but we wanted to have something concrete to start with. And uh, so we had a, U, a usability designer mock this up. You'll see that we have, um, we've titled it our patient enrollment manager. Uh, we have the ability to create a new enrollment for patients, uh, to search for patients in the list. Um, we have the patient name and their physician name. Uh, the, you'll notice that the usability designer used comedian names. He himself was a comedian, so we kind of kept that sense of humor throughout the model, which always uh, it lightened up our project meetings. So next slide, please. So now I'm jumping ahead to version 11 of the iRISE model. We reversioned our model for every design workshop that we had. And we did have about uh, 11 or 12 uh, iRISE supported design workshops. And again, we always prepared each iteration with our technical team first so that we knew that we could deliver what we were showing. We incorporated feedback from the previous version. And uh, we worked with our internal SMEs on this. These are people who deal with the doctor's offices and the patients on a daily basis. So you see um, we've actually gone to having multiple views. We have a view of enrollments that are pending, and that's what's highlighted now. We have a view of the active patient enrollments. So those are where uh, doctors and their staff would go to see the status of that patient's uh, reimbursement case. And we also have closed cases. We learned that history was very important. Uh, patients are often re-enrolled for services as they um, are being treated over time. We are expanded our search. Uh, we, instead of having a single search field, we took a stab at having a more detailed search area. We also added our notifications down to the lower right, which are um, intended to be communications from Access Solutions to doctor's offices about changes to our services and uh, maybe updated forms or a different, um, different service hours, things like that. So these are general notifications that help people access our services. You'll see we've added navigation in the top. Um, we have the uh, Enrollment Manager, which is like the report that we're seeing where you view all of your patients the create a request uh, for uh, a patient. Um, we have uh, 
register new accounts. So these are uh, ways for uh, additional members of the office to get signed up by someone who already has access. You can see that we have added our welcome area, um, the log off, the profile settings area in the top. So we, we evolved over, uh, at this point, 11 workshops. We made it very clear that this is a simulation. Uh, many people stop uh, thinking of this as a simulation and start thinking of it as an actual system. And it's important that we let them know that this is an area where we have room to play and room to design. Next slide, please. So uh, because of the technologies that we're using, primarily uh, because we're using Vignette, we needed to, at a certain point, develop HTML. The HTML layer is the actual UI that we are implementing and that lives within Vignette. And the, all of the data and functionality is hooked up to that HTML. So at a certain point, we were forced to cut over um, and start using HTML uh, in order to proceed with our project. Um, but we have found that since we transitioned over to HTML, and I think this is a very important point, since we transitioned to developing our HTML, we have had really very little design changes. They, we have certainly received feedback, and we certainly have made changes to our design, but the basic core design has remained the same, and largely the changes we've made have been cosmetic. And I have to tell you that that's, uh, again, invaluable to us. The HTML changes take much longer to make, and uh, we have fewer people who are able to do that kind of work. Uh, when we were working with iRISE, we made much more progress. We had more people who were able to do those changes, and um, we are now living with a design that has stuck through uh, the last several months of, our, months of our project. So it's really saved us time, saved us cost to do all that initial work in iRISE. So uh, about this time, we actually started to increase our partnership with the marketing team. Uh, we started off focusing on the core functionality. And it's about this time that we started overlaying the branding and the voice. You can see that we have our logo at the top. We have a, a color scheme and a style that we're working with. Um, we've incorporated some more of the UI best practices and increased our fidelity here. Um, we actually have moved some things off of this screen by this point and um, added some additional features. So uh, for example, the download forms and documents is a feature that is um, primarily lives on our public website and not within this secure application, but we wanted to make it available to people so they didn't have to leave our secure application to get at these crucial forms and other documents. Um, we've moved our notifications actually to a tab at the top as well as to the um, having some of the key notifications shown to the right. And you'll see that um, some of the nomenclature has changed. Active, the active tab became our open cases tab. And um, we're using, we've, we've probably added a few columns and removed a few columns by this point in our, in our mainframe. We have uh, the usual navigation, how many results per page, the previous, next, and pagination. Uh, next slide, please. Now about, uh, about this time, we were, as I said, we started to partner with the marketing team. And they said, wow, uh, we hope you can uh, jump on board with us. We're about to have our first usability study with an external agency. And we'd only been working with the marketing team for about two weeks at that point. And we said, wow, uh, when, when do we jump on? How, how can we participate? We would love to get feedback from real users. That's been one of our biggest challenges. And they said, uh, well, it's Thursday today, and you need to have something to the uh, usability study agency by Monday morning. So I think we've all had situations where um, we've learned at the last minute that we have an opportunity and we'd hate to miss it, but we're not sure if we can make the deadline. So because we had done so much work in iRISE, because we had such a strong uh, understanding of what it was that we were doing, and we had just started developing our HTML, we were 
um, able to uh, get some timeline clarification on the Friday. We, we learned about it Thursday. We got the timeline clarification Friday morning. We finished our HTML work, getting in some of the last things that we wanted to make sure we got feedback on over the weekend, which I, I, I'm happy we were able to do it, but uh, you know, I, I definitely owed someone some champagne on that. Um, we were able to get the HTML reviewed Monday morning and hand it off and get in on the usability study on Tuesday. And uh, really it was, we, yes we had to work a little over the weekend, but we never would have made it if we hadn't done all that visualization work. We would not have been able to generate that HTML from our documents in such a short period of time or refine what we'd already been working on. It would have been impossible. So this was our first access to end users. Um, I was able to hand off to the external usability agency uh, in about an hour. And because our model was interactive and not static, th that team was able to understand what we were doing. And again, this is the key theme. Because people can see how something is going to work, they understand it in minutes and not hours. Or if it's very complex, they might understand it in an hour or two instead of days. So we were able to move quickly, get this external usability agency on board, and they were able to help us get some really great feedback. Uh, the first piece of feedback uh, was that uh, they want they, they couldn't wait to get access to it. That's that's always uh, the best feedback you can get. Um, we uh, did learn from one person that uh, they thought that it was a little too much keying in and. We had already anticipated that some of this uh, data, the prescriber and insurance data related to patients' cases, was something that we should try to pre-populate for offices who frequently enroll patients. And unfortunately, we just weren't able to include it in our HTML at that time. But it was great to know that um, some of the things that we had planned on doing, some of the more complex features, were key and core features for our customers. So. When they saw it missing from our model, they, um, they chimed in saying they wanted it, and that was great validation for us. Now, there were some uh, recommendations that came out of the study that we had already put into place. Um, the, I'm sorry, it's kind of blocked there, but it says save as draft. Um, some of these patient enrollment forms are long. There's a lot of information they need to provide, and having a save as draft feature is really key. I, I think any good system would have something like that. We weren't able to mock it up, but we again did learn that um, it was a key feature and we were again happy to be validated in our assumptions. The, uh, also the comment around pre-populating data that they um, enter routinely, the prescriber and insurance data, uh, we had already planned for that, so we considered it done. And then everything else we learned was really about the cosmetic uh, qualities of our system. and that was great feedback for us. Um, not only uh, could we um, have concrete information about how we can improve the UI, but it also let us know that most of the things people were concerned about were easy for us to fix, and that was great news. Next slide, please. So um, I want to show you what the current version of our HTML looks like. We've done a lot of little iterations, again, uh, cosmetic. Um, largely around instructions, the names of tabs. We have included a couple of new tabs based on the feedback from now we've had two usability studies and we've been showing this to our steering committee. But as you can see, there is very little change from the basic layout, how things are prioritized, how we navigate. Very little has changed over time. We, uh, we do feel that we were able to discover our true design early on and spend most of our time refining and not reworking. Um, we've, as I said, we've introduced our help content. Um, we have uh, finalized our branding, our look and feel. And uh, with that, I think we're ready to advance to the next slide. Uh, I did want to mention that uh, we did add one page that we we really didn't anticipate, which was a, uh, a home page. And um, we thought that because people in the offices wanted to get right down into the nitty-gritty and enroll their patients and see the case status, 
we had overlooked the fact that we didn't really have a home page with summary information. And um, so we quickly were able to incorporate that based on feedback. Um, and uh, we also moved the uh, notifications, or what we came to call our updates, to this home page. Again, trying to really prioritize. Um, now again, if you're looking at a specification, you don't necessarily know if you're putting information in the right place if you are raising the right information at the right time for your users. But when you have this visual model, it's very clear to people, oh, that information is buried. Move it to the front. Create a home page. Create some summary information. And uh, these were easy things for us to do because we understood our core design. Next slide, please. So lessons learned. Uh, we learned uh, that it is a big win to have frequent iterations visual iterations. Uh, we were able to react quickly to feedback from all the various teams uh, when we learned that we were not taking a perspective into account or a new perspective came into play. We were able to react quickly, not just to design, but to bring people on board and to keep them focused on what our goals and main tasks were. Um, one of the things that I am most excited about uh, personally is that I spent very little time developing PowerPoint presentations that helped people understand what we were doing. Those PowerPoint presentations um, really can be throwaway work where you use it and then it's outdated and it's, you don't use it again, but you have to develop more and more uh, new slides as the system evolves. I spent that time exposing our model to the various team members and agencies and evolving that model with the internal team, which is not throwaway work. That's, that's value add every step of the way. And of course, uh, some of our biggest wins have been around our positive study results and um, generating great buzz in our user community. And they, they can't wait to get their hands on this. Uh, next time, if I were, uh, you know, um, if I'd done the first time around, if I had spent more time on the page flow and a little less time on the details, I think uh, I would have even been able to move even faster. I think we all tend to get caught in the details, but um, page flow is very important because that's how people understand the big picture, and that's how people understand if we're putting information in the right place. And if we have the right information, does it create the right story? Does it create the right um, picture for our users. So again, it's, um, it's, it's important to judge and to know when to add details, um, when to get into that level of detail versus make sure everyone is on the same page and that we are telling a good story. So um, I, can't, I can't emphasize enough that that big picture vision, the end-to-end -end flow is very important. I thought I understood that going in, but I realized I could have done even more to have that focus and make sure everyone understood the end-to-end -end vision. Um, some of our challenges, uh, we didn't have too many challenges, but um, it, if we had more of a connection between our iRISE and the HTML, I think we would even save even more time. We'd be more empowered. Um, I understand why iRISE does not want to become a development tool. I really respect that. Uh, I just do notice that, um, that that translation to the HTML, which we had to do on our project, um, was a slow point, a bit of a bottleneck for us. Um, we are a Mac and PC shop. Um, a lot of the people in our IT team and also uh, at this point everyone in our sales and marketing team have Macs. So any, any uh, in increased support for Mac users, we're big fans. I also do have a PC. I have both machines. So for me it hasn't been a problem. but. Um, the best part uh, about the uh, sharing the iRISE model is you can do it via the web. So that really does make the sharing internally a lot easier. And it doesn't matter if you have a Mac or PC. Uh, sharing with our partners outside the firewall, well, that's just a problem that we haven't solved yet. Um, so we have all of our iRISE models on the server. And it would be great to have our external partners uh, at the agencies be able to come in, but they don't always have access. So sometimes we have to send them the models and have them send comments back. Again, not a huge challenge, but it is something that we have faced. And uh, next slide, please. 
So I want to thank everyone for their time. Uh, I really want to thank Mitch Bishop at iRise and everyone at Modern Analyst for hosting this. And I turn it back over to Mitch for questions. Thanks so much, Susanna. That was great. And we've got a ton of questions. Um, before we get to them, I just want to remind everybody that uh, we will get to as many of these as possible. But uh, for all the questions we don't get to, we will uh, definitely engage with you guys over email and make sure that your, your questions are answered. And I'll try and lump some of these together. I mean, there's, there's categories of questions as well. So hopefully we'll get to them. Um, probably uh, a, the most common question right now is people want to know how they can uh, see the software and try it out. And I'll just uh, answer that one first and just let you know that if you go to uh, www.irise.com, you can take a quick product tour. Um, you can also download a 30-day free trial of iRise. And there's free e-learning available from our site online. So between those resources, I think um, that should take care of uh, uh, answering a lot of that, a lot of those questions. Hey, Susanna, we're getting a lot of questions about process and, and in particular, the agile-like approach that you've taken. I think it's a really interesting story that, you know, with clinicians uh, especially, where you only have a few minutes of their time, that a rapid iterative approach is really, uh, if you'll pardon the pun, prescribed. <laughs> and uh, you know, so how did you um, uh, approach that challenge with visualization? I mean, uh, ad, traditional Agile is, you know, you move straight to code. And so how do you work visualization into an Agile process? Well, for us, um, one, one of the ways in which we're Agile in our department is that um, we do some overlap of our projects while we're in deployment phase for one project. We're starting the plan and um, design phase for the next project. So before we really had access to the people who do the code, um, we were able to do the code-like work in iRISE. We were able to, um, when we did have the attention of our technical team, who was still finishing up their last uh, engagement, um, we were able to quickly verify with them that what we were building could be coded. And that was really the key thing. And um, we had a standing Tuesday meeting. Uh, we had standing Friday design workshops. And so between our Tuesday sort of pseudo code review, if you want to call it that, um, and our Friday uh, design sessions with our access solutions team, we were able to refine our models and get them out so that by the time that we were hitting the code, Again, um, we pretty much had our design in place. And at that point, uh, the coders could uh, do their thing pretty much interrupted. And we were focusing mainly on our, our look and feel, our branding, our voice. So we were sort of able to preempt that, um, get straight to the code. And, and quite honestly, um, our Salesforce environment, where a lot of our code resides, uh, is is not as accessible. And we don't even really show our Salesforce environment. So um, for us, it's much more about usability and exposing our rich data through this great UI. And um, yeah. but there is a lot of coding on the back end. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, so how long were your sprints then? Well, we, did, we basically did a, a 10-week uh, design up front. That was our harmonization, if I can use that term. And uh, then once we got to coding, um, I'd really, uh, I'd have to say, we did, we did a November push, we did a January push. Um, it's been, it's been interesting because we actually haven't spent nearly as much time on the coding as we have on agreeing how things should look and feel. So because, yeah. again, usability is, is huge for us. Yeah, I mean, uh, we have a lot of our customers, um, everyone that's asking these Agile questions, we have a lot of customers that use visualization in an Agile approach. And uh, if I can simplify a lot of complex conversation down to um, a more simple model, in general, our customers use visualization at the beginning of the sprint. Uh, you might visualize uh, the first three or four days of a sprint and making, make sure that the cross-functional team is on the same page. And then you would switch into code. Um, and uh, it sounds like you guys are doing something similar, except for your sprints are longer. Yes, and it has a lot to do with the fact that um, our, de our development teams 
are split across several different projects. So we do these sprints, and then we sort of lay off for a little while, um, and then we do some more of those types of sprints. And, um, and now right. we're in our testing phase, just about ready to deploy. So um, we're just in defect resolution mode at this point. Right. So you know, there's I think there's different levels of of agile. There's and there's you know there's waterfall, there's hybrid waterfall agile, and there's sort of agile like, and then there's sort of orthodox agile, if mm -hmm. you will. I think and we've been uh, more in the hybrid at times, just due to yeah. It sounds like you you guys are more in the hybrid model. Yeah. Cool. I would prefer uh, to actually do more of the agile, but again, um, we support several different applications at the same time, and. I think some of the other ones would have benefited from more visualization. So uh, I, I'm curious to see uh, how we can get some of those other teams on board. Um, we're getting a number of questions about how you document the text requirements at your company. Do you use iRISE to do that? And how do you do that? And how do you also have a requirements management system that, that does things like traceability? We don't. We have talked about a requirements management system. Um, we have yet to be able to really um, implement it. We're, we're moving fast. We, we're moving fast through some integrations and through some uh, growing market areas. So we haven't, we haven't been able to carve out the time for that. But um, we did manage to carve out the time to adopt iRISE, which is really helpful. And we do have some, because we are in a regulated industry, we do have some fairly strict uh, documentation requirements. So it is more challenging for us to find systems that uh, we can't just plug and play or uh, any kind of requirements management system. So that's been a, a challenge for us in general. Um, but we are managing our text requirements in uh, Word templates. So that's our final deliverable. That all goes to Word. Uh, we, as part of our adoption strategy, I would like for us to do more of the management in iRISE. We, we haven't gotten there yet. Um, so generally, I, I, I work the model as long as I can, and then when I need to go from uh, one phase of the project to the next, I uh, create the documentation, and I generally do essentially a final cut with minimal revisions, and I'm able to get that signed off. And it's much easier because people know what they're signing, as we've talked about. They, they can play with the model and, and then sign, as opposed to read, wonder right. what they're getting, and sign. Yeah, just a, 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 and a word about iRISE. You can document your text requirements in iRISE. Um, you can associate text requirements with elements on the screen or in use case scenarios. And you can also, at the click of a button, generate a full functional spec from the product so that um, the, the artifacts that get created from iRISE are the visualization itself and the functional spec. And well, that's how a lot of our customers use our product. I was able to use the documentation features as um, when we were doing design, I did plug in requirements so that I could confirm that we were meeting requirements and not missing them, because we did have a, a mm -hmm. good number of them. And we actually were able to remove a number because we realized how redundant they were. Yeah, that's great. So it was uh, more back, to the, back to the process topic again, a couple of questions on process. You know, um, we're getting question about how does visualization fit into various process models. And I guess I'll take a stab at that and just say, look, you know, we haven't found a process model that out there yet where visualization doesn't fit in. So whatever process you have today, the first step that you want to take with visualization is um, incorporating visualization. You, the first project uh, you want to use visualization on, you want to just incorporate it into your current process as yet another artifact that gets developed. And what you'll quickly find, I think, is that in your second project and, and subsequent projects, you'll want to visualize first uh, rather than document text first and then create a visualization from the, the text. And uh, that seems to be best practice out there for um, no matter what SDLC process that you have. And again, there's sort of waterfall. There's kind of hybrid approaches. There's a loose, uh, rapid, iterative model. And then there's customers that we have that ad adhere strictly to Agile. And we ourselves, in fact, are an, are an Agile shop inside of our own engineering team. And, and uh, of course, we 
visualize everything before we, we build it on um, ourselves. I hey, Susanna, more. Uh, Susanna how more. long did it take uh, your BAs to learn iRise? Well, the ones that have really uh, gone through the training and adopted it, um, we did our week-long um, training. We did a two-day in-house hands-on training session with an iRise trainer. Then we did three days of follow-up mentoring. And uh, we target business systems analysts who are working on a project that are in uh, either the beginning of the requirements or the beginning of a design phase. Some of our projects weren't quite long, so we, we try to get them trained at the time that they can immediately start to use the project. So um, I couldn't tell you at this point exactly how many business systems analysts are using it because our team is a bit dispersed at this point. We used to be centralized. Um, but I would say there's about 15 of us um, who have been trained in, uh, in iRISE and gone through the mentoring process, which is really key. To turn around and immediately use it on something that is context-specific is, uh, to me, just as valuable as the initial training. That's great. And just to give feedback on, <coughs> on that question from our other customers, we have customers um, that literally have hundreds of business analysts trained on iRISE, and uh, you can adopt iRISE and train your BAs in a couple of different models. One is you know, um, having our professional services team come in and provide mentoring and training, which we're happy to do. Um, some of our larger customers have, have taken a train-the-trainer kind of approach and now literally have hundreds of BAs um, you know, banging away on visualizations every day and, and uh, have transformed very large organizations into a model where you're actually um, required to visualize new products before you're, you're um, able to get funding or you know, approval to move forward with the project. I was just invited to speak to my senior director around um, the topic of revising our business systems analyst job family description, and she wanted to know specifically how visualization would fit into that. So um, right. they're seeing the power of it. And we really are still in our adoption phase, and um, I am very hopeful that they will be, they realize that this is a key part in us being effective, and we'll work it into our descript the description of our job, not just something we do. Got it. A um, couple of quick questions here, and then we're going to finish up. But um, we're getting a question about, uh, can you use iRise to visualize fat client kinds of applications? And the answer is yes, absolutely. And uh, the way you do that is, is you take screen grabs from your package application or your, your fat client system, and then you start overlaying behavior and data interactions on top of that. And then, um, Susanna, just uh, to wrap up with you, final question. Um, your, uh, your project, what was the total duration of the project, and how much time did you estimate the visualization saved? Well. It's a, it's a little hard to answer because we, when we uh, reorganized and started partnering with the marketing team, our project took on a bit of a new direction. Uh, we started our design phase in June of last year um, where we agreed that we were past our plan phase and that we would go into um, sort of our hybrid uh, waterfall slash agile and, and development phase. Uh, we went from so from June, we went through to September, and uh, that was we had some delays there. So we were uh, originally planning to be done sooner, but we had some external delays. Uh, and then we went through our build phase uh, and our sort of expanded UI design uh, with the marketing team from September to December. And our yeah. test phase started in January, and we are just about finished. And um, any any metrics or results around time saved? Well, we we do uh, look to partner further with iRise and, and other people to get better at that. Uh, we we recognize that that's sometimes hard to do when you're first starting, um, but I I can tell you what I hear from people I work with. Uh, the best example I can give you is my partner on the security team said, this saved us 70% of the time that we would normally spend clarifying what we're doing. 
Yeah, that's, that's a common. He said. That's a common thing that we hear is that requirement cycle times are, are dramatically shrunk, and then of course when you're eliminating rework, you're eliminating about you know 30 percent of, of the development time downstream. So, Suzanne, I want to thank you very much. Um, this was really interesting. I apologize to everybody; we can't get to all the questions, but again, we will follow up with everyone individually and make sure your questions get answered. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Adrian. Thank you, everybody. Thank you again for attending this modern analyst webinar. And many thanks again to Susanna and Mitch for a very informative presentation. I wanted to remind everybody that the webinar, along with the slides, will be archived at modernanalyst.com within a few days. This concludes today's event, and thank you again. We hope you have a great day.